First of all, uh, welcome to our meeting. Uh, we're pretty excited to have uh, have this happen. Like I, I mentioned before, we're kind of missing that socialization aspect and, and the lunch and a couple of, of other things, but we thought that it would still be a good idea to connect uh, this winter, throw out some of these hard hitting topics and also see if, if anyone have any questions. Basically, uh, next, we're gonna go through uh, just a quick meeting schedule and introduce our speakers. So I'll be going over this local alfalfa project um, that I am a volunteer for here. Uh, and so we are looking for some cooperators. That's my that's my shtick for this meeting. After that, we'll hear from Michael Weir, which is the area agronomist from Pioneer about a BMR corn, and more specifically, some new Pioneer BMR corn. So that'll be exciting. Uh, we have Dan Weersma joining us from Wisconsin today to talk about uh, silage inoculant and some of the updates in that division. Uh, Rhonda Chestnut's here from North Star Forages to give us some local high protein options um, to look at, uh, especially for this spring and, and going forward, just because you know we know that um, that sometimes the alfalfa is, uh, um, you know, we're looking for alternatives. Now for this alfalfa study, um, basically it's run by the Canadian Gra uh, Forage and Grasslands Association, um, which is a, a pretty big deal. It's Canada wide and uh, they're running in every province. I am a volunteer for this project as a field advisor. And so I will be monitoring uh, fields in the area for winter kill essentially and documenting uh, some photos and notes for that um, for this government program. We are looking for five to eight cooperators willing to uh, participate with one field each. There's multiple spots within each field that will get documented. The criteria is that it needed to be seeded in 2019 or 2020 um, and expected to be kept until 2023. That's kind of the big one. This is a long project for the next three years. Um, we can have some fields that are seeded in 2021, but most of them have to be seeded last year or prior. The stand in the field can be pure alfalfa or a mix, as long as the, mature, the majority is alfalfa. And then the other thing is that this field and the management records have to be accessible for the uh, duration of the project. The um, monitoring and the documentation uh, includes soil samples for this fall, uh, plant counts in the spring and fall for the next three years, basically. Uh, root assessments in the spring and fall, as well as photos and videos. We do have access to a drone for this project and a pretty um, nice data collection site. So again, we're looking for five or more uh, cooperators in our area for this project. You know, if you really want someone to keep a close eye on an alfalfa field, this would be a good fit. Or if you have um, uh, something in mind, please let me know. Basically, we're participating because I think that this would be a great opportunity to take a look, a closer look and, and, and gather data at what's out there because we've had a few rough uh, winters with alfalfa and just to have some of this information firsthand and be a part of this project would be beneficial to, to us here in Manitoba. I just wanted to do a quick seed supply update from our cutlet seeds. We have come across a couple extra haymaker forage oats in our supply. Um, if you are interested, please let me know um, as soon as you can. Basically, I, I expect these to uh, sell out quickly, um, as the rest have. <laughs> um, select corn silage hybrids are in good supply. Uh, we're getting a little tight on some of those later CRM products. Uh, so if you are looking to expand uh, later CRM corn silage acres, please let us know. We'll, we'll definitely have to... Uh, Check out what we have and what's a good fit for you. Some of the earlier corn is still in, in good supply and green corn uh, shouldn't be a problem as of right now. Most pioneer alfalfa varieties are in good supply and then North Star seeds as well. A lot of our popular options there. Just want to do a quick update for our dairy trials at Mark Cutlet Seeds. Um, we have done lots of trials in the past. You know, we're, we're really into the trial thing and especially with dairies, but I feel like in the past few years, you know, we've really had the opportunity to fine tune these trials. We have the new portable scales. Uh, this makes it a lot more flexible for us to do trials as well as courtesy ways. Um, with every test strip, like I'm not sure if everyone knows this, with every test strip, you do get a complimentary feed analysis from the Pioneer Lab. 
So I freeze those samples and ship them to, uh, I think it's Iowa. <laughs> uh, and then they do get tested there. Um, we can do genetic, agronomic, and courtesy ways um, for, for trials. Um, there is a Yield Hero contest running again in 2021. We would like to congratulate again uh, the Roswitha Holsteins and the Mueller's for winning in 2020. Um, that was a, a great corn plot as well as a great prize. So that's those are all things that we can do uh, easily planned in advance. You know, spring is a good time to make a side by side, even if it's two strips. And if not, you know, in the fall, if things line up too, you just let us know. So that's all I have for uh, for my bit here. All right. Well, thanks, Karis, and good morning, everyone. As Karis mentioned, this is a little bit different than the than the status quo that we've done in the past, but you know, nonetheless, it's a lot of good information here. Hopefully, that you guys can you can apply to your operation and and also have it some a really uh, you know a lot of good uh, participants on the panel here uh, with some of the folks that that uh, Karis has on the agenda. So. Um, I'm not sure what we're doing for questions. Maybe just leave towards the end if, if we can get back to you with, with uh, some answers to your questions if you want to type them in the box. But uh, what I was asked to do today is just give a bit of an update on, on Pioneer Genetics and where we are with BMR. Um, and then just pro provide a bit of an overview as far as uh, you know the, the, the Pioneer lineup that Mark Cutlet Seeds has to, to offer on, on the silage front. So for a number of years now, we've been getting getting questions from from folks like yourselves on on BMR. What is it? Uh, when will Pioneer have it? And uh, what are the advantages, disadvantages to BMR? And where does it fit on my operation? And and there's been a lot of buzzwords in the industry industry the last couple of years as far as uh, leafy corn, flowery corn, um, you know, products that are better in fiber digestibility products that are that are worse for um, fiber digestibility et cetera, et cetera. just a lot of marketing buzzwords um and in pioneer we've been doing a lot of work and and one person in particular bill mahana we've had come up to speak to you guys uh in the past whether it's in person or or over a zoom meeting like this uh you know just going over understanding fiber digestibility and, and kind of putting some of these buzzwords to rest so you know, as we saw locally, we have seen differences in fiber digestibility within our, our products uh, over the last couple of years. And, and really the, the biggest key to that is, is the environment that our corn hybrids are, are grown in. So perfect example is the last couple of years, we've had some drier conditions. And with that, we've had uh, slightly lower yields as far as tonnage breaker on our silage corn. But what we have seen is, is improved fiber digestibility. Um, and then there's there's the flip side to that, where we've had some wetter years, where we've had you know quite favorable conditions, uh, really high tonnage or, or corn silage yields, um, but you might see your fiber digestibility creep back a little bit. So so in a nutshell, what we see is is fiber digestibility uh, within our conventional corn products are are very dependent on the environment that they're grown in, the conditions that you're given that particular year, with the exception of, of BMR. Um, BMR is, is a technology or, a, or corn genetics that have improved fiber digestibility consistently over some of the conventional products that we have traditionally grown. So what you get with BMRs is uh, less lignin and with that higher fiber digestibility, increased dry matter intake within your, within your, uh, your production as far as your, your silage poly you're feeding through. But uh, the challenge has been with BMR is, is capturing that improved agronomics that we see within our conventional products, um, like our traditional uh, dual purpose products that were grown for silage in our geography. Generally, what you see is that improved fiber digestibility with BMR, but you're sacrificing a little bit of the agronomics that uh, we see within our, our traditional products, such as you know, stock strength, roots, um, disease uh, tolerance or resistance, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's it's up to companies like Pioneer to bring forward products in that BMR market segment with improved agronomics and technology in the technology segments. The other challenge is we've, with us growing corn in the north here, maturity is such a key. 
and uh, we need we need to grow products that fit within the, the short growing season that we're we're dealt with in Western Canada. And the BMR products that we have seen have, have been more uh, um, favored or tailored to uh, you know Wisconsin or the or the growing growing uh, the corn corn belt down in the states. Uh, we've seen those maturities shorten up a bit where we have moved north into northern Wisconsin, up into eastern Canada. And now we finally are starting to see some products come within that maturity that we can start to dabble it, dabble a little bit with the BMR. Um, so again, to summarize this slide, slide here is, is BMR does have a fit within a dairy operation as far as uh, slightly improved fiber digestibility uh, within your production practices, but just understanding that it has to fit within the agronomic uh, challenges that we do deal with. So um, generally we do, we do uh, encourage growers on the BMR front to make sure that they have high productive fields, good fertility, good growing conditions. And with that, we can see improved yield with high, higher fiber digestibility at the BMR. So with that, we have seen, as I mentioned, some products that have shortened up in maturity where we can start to offer um, some potential products in that, that BMR segment. And the first one that we've, we've had uh, brought forward to us is, is P9482 SXE. So uh, this is a product that's been advanced more so for Eastern Canada. But again, it, it, it does get closer to a maturity where we can have a look to see what it does in Western Canada. Again, at that 94 CRM, it is gonna be pretty long in the tooth for a lot of growers on the call here, but it uh, you know allows us the opportunity to get, get this product in the trials that uh, Karis was mentioned, was talking about a little bit earlier and just seeing what they do uh, within, our, within Western uh, Canada, particularly in Southern Manitoba within uh, Mark Cutlet Seeds Agency and where it fits on, on dairy, um, the dairy farms like yourselves. So we don't know a lot about this one as far as how it does perform in Western Canada because we simply haven't seen it uh, grown in this area. So that's why we're, we need to evaluate this in Manitoba, which we will do um, with a number of our agencies within Southern Manitoba. And especially in, in uh, with Mark, Ben and, and Karis, we'll be really seeing where this one fits within their area. Um, particularly on your farms. Um, the one thing I do see in here is it does have a fairly good agronomic uh, characteristics chart. Uh, again, some of the key things that we look at is Goss's wilt being one of the key diseases that we deal with uh, within our area. It has a very good Goss's wilt rating um, and it does have average uh, to above average stock and stock and roots on it. So again, some of the concerns that we do see sometimes with BMR products being slightly uh, for a character six chart on agronomics, this one does look fairly stable and strong in that regard. So again, if we have a fit for maturity here, uh, we have good agronomics, slightly improved fiber digestibility, this could be a fit on, on your dairy operations going into the future. And with that being said, as we move into the future and we're testing these products more extensively, we will start to see these BMR genetics uh, creep a little bit earlier in maturity where we see um, you know, we're going to see products more so in that early 90, uh, mid to late 80 CRM that fit, fit more, uh, more farms within this area in particular. And then to summarize and, and uh, complete the lineup that, that Mark Hutton Seeds has to offer, we have a very extensive silage lineup and, you know, a lot of things that, that growers like yourselves are, are looking for, we can offer you, whether it's you know, whether it's high moisture corn, um, whether it's corn that you're looking, your fields that you're looking to grow into corn that you want to chop a little bit and leave the rest uh, for grain corn. We do have, we do have early maturing products that fit more of that dual purpose segment where we get good grain production, but also a, a bigger plant where we get good tonnage as well from the silage aspect. So P7861R uh, fills that void there. Um, if you're getting a little bit, uh, Further north, where maturity becomes more of an issue when you get north of number one, uh, 7861 with good plant height, uh, good grain on it, so you still get that good energy in your pile, um, has a good fit within, within those types of operations. A new product that we, we advanced this year from our, from our impact programs uh, is P8294. And when I looked at this product in our impacts uh, the last couple of years, it, it really had a nice silage look to it. 
and and we did advance it more so for for the need as as a silage product that's that's uh, got good solid agronomics, so good stalks, good roots, good goss. It's got a, a good look to it as far as plant heights. We get that we get that tonnage, and then it's got uh, maturity and, and grain fill on it, where we still get tonnage and, and energy from that ear that that uh, that particular hybrid's providing. So I see this one filling uh, a lot of needs as far as high moisture corn uh, as we get a little bit. Uh, earlier maturity, or I, I guess we get north of number one up onto the hill where it's going to fit a fit very well for a silage maturity as well in that 82 CRM. Um, you know, and particularly in, in, in uh, Karisben and Mark's area, area it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a dual purpose product where if you do want high moisture corn, uh, if you do want to leave it there, you want to chop it before you get to high moisture corn, it's going to have a good fit there. And then finally, 8407Q. Uh, this one's had a very good year from silage, uh, silage performance, um, not only in Hutlet's area, but as well as other agencies that we work with. Um, nice, nice maturity. It's, it's not too early, but it's not too late. So it kind of uh, buffers the risk as far as the variability we might get in our growing season. If we get an early frost, this one quite often has, has at least got down to that milk line progression where it's safe from a uh, killing frost where we still have good quality silage. Um, the other aspect of it is it, it's a Q um, trait package. So we have chrome uh, protection for below ground against corn rootworm, if that's a concern of yours, but also above ground corn borer as well. So we get we get good uh, BT protection against insects that you guys are dealing with. Um, so overall, just a really solid um, so, solid product that, that fits a lot of farms within within the Hotlands area. Then as we get into the more traditional um, traditional maturities for corn silage, that 80, 85 to, to 90 CRM, we have a lot of good core products, in particular the 8736 that we've seen with with a good performance, a nice goss rating for the for Hotlands area, good tall plant. Um, good tonnage and silage characteristics on it. And then 8859, we won't see a lot of this year. It is new to us as well, where Eastern Canada has advanced that one as a very tall product with, with, um, with an earlier silk date. So generally we get better grain development on that one. So it's, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited to see what this one can do for silage in, in our area. You get that plant height, but also very good grain characteristics too, which fits very well on a dairy operation to make sure we have that good starch energy component. 8820 is, is favored very well for a dairy operation as well. It's a little bit of a shorter plant, but very good grain characteristics on it. Um, and then the, the Q or the Chrome technology segment too, for anyone that wants to go a little bit later, but wants that protection against uh, Northern corn rootworm as well. And then to round up the silage lineup, uh, we look at, uh, you know, that late 80 into that 90 to 93 CRM segment. We have been asked over the last couple of years, just with some of the longer growing seasons we've had, how much longer can we, can we stretch out as far as maturity? And uh, that's where these products come into play. So uh, 9188 is, is an old, um, called the old dog. It's been around for many years. And the reason it has been is it's just been a consistent product in the lineup in Northern States, Eastern Canada and, and Western Canada too, as, as far as a silage product. It's just old faithful where if you're looking to put some of your acres in a consistent product, uh, it's, been, it's been proven year, year in, year out for a number of years. This is the product that fits your farm. Um, also available in, in, uh, in AMXT if you're dealing with any below ground insects like northern corn rootworm. 9233, 9301 I'll talk about together. These were two new products to us last year that, that uh, we had a look at. Um, again, if you're looking to stretch things out into a late maturity, if you're looking for protection against below ground insects like northern corn rootworm, that's where this product fits. So to summarize, all in all, Whatever it is that you're 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 needing on your farm, whether it's an earlier maturity with good silage characteristics, good grain characteristics, um, you know we have a pile of products anywhere from from 72 all the way to to 93 CRM, um, 
again, and then we can we can fill those those voids as far as those traits that you're looking for. Uh, in particularly where we have been growing a lot of corn, uh, tight rotation, more so in that silage market, we have seen northern corn rootworms stretching up into Western Canada. Uh, just know that we do have we do have a lot of products, um, anywhere from a 75 CRM up to 93. Uh, that has below ground protection against northern corn rootworms. So we do have lots of options for you there. And then finally, I think the important thing we got to we got to realize too is Mark Cutlet seeds and the work they've done with the with the with the trials that they position in your area. Um, you know, the, the best kind of data is local data, and uh, within our pioneer agencies in Manitoba, Mark Cutlet seeds really sets the bar as far as the data they're generating for you guys to make decisions on your farm on what what's going to work the best. So with the products that you see on this slide here, they are tried, tested um, within your area locally. And uh, we do have local data we can then provide you to make your decisions on your farm going forward. So again, just a bit of a, an update on what we have to offer as far as, as silage corn. We do have BMR starting to sneak into our lineup here now. Um, but the lineup is very strong as far as maturities we have to offer in the technology segments uh, for protection against that silage yield. We're excited for the BMR and we'd like to highlight that 8294. That's kind of a, a gap in our lineup right now and it's going to provide that, that nice dual purpose option. The breeding programs that are looking at BMR are, are south of us or east of us. So we're for the, for the infancy stage as far as BMR, that we have to work with is going to be something is going to be those later maturities um, but i think it's 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 exciting to see that those maturities are creeping earlier or we can now start to dabble in it to understand how bmr uh, performs as far as as far as over our traditional corn genetics that we're growing so um, very exciting to see um, and just talking with folks like well dan weersman is on the on the call here as, as well as bill Mahana and just some of the work that they've done uh, looking at BMR and where it fits in within a silage operation. Um, yeah, for sure. We do, see, we do see improved dry matter intake and that fiber digestibility in that regard. Yeah, I would just uh, comment, Karis. I I'm, uh, was asked about a year ago to be the product lead for BMR in, in Corteva and uh, Pioneer. Okay. So, uh, yeah, there's some exciting new stuff on the way. Uh, the R4, R5 Advancement class has some earlier maturity products that look very nice. And uh, yeah, excited to be able to start filling some of those gaps. Right on. Well, thanks for the, the update, yeah. All right, thanks, Karis. Uh, good morning, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about the inoculant products uh, at Pioneer and why why perhaps we even bother thinking about inoculants. So I'm gonna walk you through a, a few slides here. Um, this picture I like because it, uh, it is a great example of when ensiling fails. Um, essentially you have a compost pile. So when, when ensiling process uh, fails or even partly fails, um, it, it's because you're getting extended respiration loss, you're getting heating loss, the, the, Carbohydrates and sugars uh, are lost, proteins are degraded. You end up with more yeasts and molds uh, that grow. And ultimately that, you know, is feed is either, uh, you know, not as, not as digestible or it may actually at the end reduce animal intakes or uh, you end up throwing a, a lot of it away. So, so what can we do about that? Um, Let's talk a little bit about where we find those losses. Uh, so in the filling process, uh, we see anywhere from two to 7% of our losses occur during that time. During those initial hours of, of putting uh, silage in a silo, you have respiration continuing and respiration is the plant, plant's activity that it normally does in the field where it's um, emitting CO2 and using up sugars uh, to create CO2, water, and heat uh, or energy. Sometimes we get a bit of seepage loss that's usually pretty small. Uh, more loss occurs really during those early uh, couple of days of fermentation in what we call gaseous loss. Again, that fermentation process 
as a cost in terms of energy. It's going to need sugars. It's going to need carbohydrates to proceed. But our goal is to minimize that loss right there. Uh, and then finally, when you um, sort of reopen that, that silo and you have surface exposure and feed out, there's a lot of opportunity there for losses as well when that silage is re-exposed to air and uh, what we consider aerobic stability losses. So all told, you could have anywhere from 12 to 40 or more percent uh, loss in a silo, um, you know, just from all of these processes. So it can be very significant. So one of the things we think about is shrink and dry matter recovery. So the tons that you harvest off of the field is not the same tons that you feed to the cows uh, because in that process, you have this shrink and dry matter loss. So if for instance, I harvested 10 tons off the field, I probably only have eight to nine tons that actually make it to the cow uh, as, as feed. That is expensive. Uh, that dry matter loss can be expensive. As I pointed out, it's probably ranging somewhere from 12 to you know, 20 plus percentage. Uh, that value of that, so for every, um, you know, so when, when you have dry matter loss or, or when you go through the fermentation process, if I put in material at 65% moisture, and that means I have 35 tons of actual dry matter in, in 100 tons. If I have, uh, for instance, a 10% loss, now I've lost 3.1 tons of material. And that material is really around the starches and sugar. So it's really highly valuable. And how do we value that? We essentially compare it to the cost of corn grain. So, um, you know, with, with increasing losses come, come increasing costs or value of that. And um, our goal with inoculants is to move you up that ladder. So if I'm at, you know, 15% loss today, can I get you to 12.5% loss? And we are confident we can do that with good inoculants. So what is going on in that uh, ensiling process? You know, people say, well, it can ensile itself. Yes and no. Um, what you pull in off of the field uh, are bacteria, molds, bacteria, and essentially most of those are very undesirable. Uh, especially things like yeasts and bacillus. Uh, bacillus actually can double, it has a very fast growth rate, doubles in, in a half hour to an hour. And we have very few naturally occurring desirable bacteria like the lactobacillus plantarium. So at the end of the day, it's a race to see which bugs, the good ones or the bad ones, will dominate that silage mass first. And uh, what we find is that the best inoculants will use less energy. So here's an example of the uh, dry matter digestibility of forage from a couple of different uh, brands of, of products as compared to our 1174 in the, on the top part there. So that difference between the dotted red line and the solid red line is a digestible, uh, a digestibility energy, uh, difference and um, it, it represents the additional energy that it took some of those other inoculants to, uh, to ensile that forage. Uh, on the back end side or the, the aerobic stability side, again, the same thing, the more um, we can preserve digestibility, the better we are. So in Pioneer, we do have some very crop specific products. And um, why do we do that? Uh, well, in part because each of our crops um, are, you know, have a range of digest or a range of ferment fermentability. And so the hardest one to ferment is actually high moisture corn because of the high yeast loads that often come. It's low in moisture, low in sugars. Uh, the easiest actually is corn silage uh, because it, it has relatively low buffering capacity. It has high sugar content um, when we direct cut it off the field. But what we found in our research is that if we can select strains of inoculants that are specific to the crop, we're going to have faster uh, drop in our pH and uh, a better fermentation with, that's more efficient. 
So talking about the uh, heating that goes on, there's really two types of heating that occur with, in, with silages. The first is what we would term physiological or, or the heat of respiration and, uh, during fermentation. And that's gonna occur you know, generally as long as the uh, silo has some air capacity or you know, is not completely anaerobic, it's, it's going to occur. In general, we see the whole silage mass increase in temperature through this process by about eight to 12 degrees Celsius. The other heating, and that the one that's really more problematic is this microbial heating that occurs. And it's that heat that's produced from the growing yeast and molds and aerobic bacteria, especially when they're re-exposed to air at the feed out time. And so this picture shows you know, a picture of a silo and you see both the silo face and a pile of forage in front of it. And in the lower picture, then the heating, uh, the darker red being and white being the hottest spots in that picture uh, as based on an infrared camera. So we call this um, back end stability or heating during the, the feed out phase. Um, often called aerobic stability. And we do have an inoculant that will, will help stop this. And uh, so as we look at the, L, the Lactobacillus buchneri inoculants, uh, what they do differently is they convert the lactic acid that had you know, been the initial part of the fermentation process, they convert it to acetic acid and some propionic acid. And what's good about that is it prevents yeast from growing even in the presence of air. So it's going to leave you with a more stable product. The picture here, you've got a treated and untreated side. Again, you can see from an infrared camera which one is heating up quickly uh, when that silo is faced. In research trials, uh, you know, as we look at aerobic stability, what we do is we measure how long does it take before that silage starts heating up. And so in 15 replications as shown here with the Buchneri versus a more of our, you know, non-Buchneri product, you see all of those blue bars, you know, most of the time we have great uh, extension of our, um, of, well, most of the time it's preventing the silage from heating up and uh, as compared to the, the more conventional inoculant where when you re-expose it to air, you do actually get increased heating. So what does all of that uh, back-end uh, heating cost us? Uh, you know, the, uh, the cost is really in the amount of digestible dry matter that you can recover. And, you know, with a, simple, with a single product like 1174, which is a good product, but it doesn't have the Buchneri in it, when it's re-exposed to air and, and not managed correctly, you can have pretty large reductions in dry matter uh, loss. The other thing is that we see a lot more yeast and mold that grow. And so um, again, if we can stop that, especially yeast, we can also stop the, the aerobic instability at feed out. So why, why pioneer inoculants? Uh, one is, this is what the cows tell us that in 143 dry matter recovery trials, our inoculants are reducing nutrient loss and shrink and they're reducing heating loss and spoilage on the back end. In the actual feeding trials, we've got 56 beef feeding trials that improved animal performance, it improved their efficiency. And, um, and in the dairy trials, we we've see increased milk production. So a lot of strong evidence that says these inoculants are doing some very special things for us in, in preserving the feed, but also improving our digestibility long-term. And again, part of that question about why Pioneer inoculants, we do have unique strains, they're patented. They're very efficient at the fermentation on that front end fermentation. They are um, bacteria. So, you know, with any bacteria, you wanna make sure that these are living organisms on the day that you get it gets delivered to the forage. And uh, so we do a lot of research work. Uh, we've done a lot over the years to make sure we maximize the activity of those bacteria and the efficiency at which they operate. And 
the high quality control measures we implement in our production of these inoculants is, is really guaranteeing that you have live bacteria delivered to your forage. The, uh, in addition to that, we you know, provide some applicator support, some nutritional expertise. You have the ability to return unused uh, inoculants and you know, by purchasing inoculants as part of your whole forage package, you do increase your quantity discounts on seed. So let's touch on a, a couple of key products then that uh, we are selling and, and really are important. So first of all is 1174. This was a first generation product uh, designed for multiple crops. Uh, still a very good product um, for, you know, general use. It did improve fermentation. It did increase our nutrient retention and digestibility. It did reduce dry matter loss. So all of those things are very positive. And it, and the, it still does a very good job. As we look now to um, alfalfa in particular, or alfalfa grass mixtures, what I want you to go to is 11H50, because hands down, this is going to do two things. It's going to be more efficient at the fermentation process. So you're, you're going to recover more dry matter, even then compared to the 1174. The other thing it does, and, and really important here, is that it, um, minimize, it minimizes our ammonium nitrogen loss uh, that, that occurs with a, with a high protein crop like alfalfa. So those are important features, um, you know, helps reduce that protein degradation, improves our dry matter recovery. Looking at the questions, how long does a bacteria live uh, once it's mixed with water? So good question. Um, those bacteria in our, by design are, you know, expected to live for a period of time. What we do prefer is that if you have to take, you know, you, you mix it up, you put it on the harvester, if you, if you get delayed overnight, for instance, we ask that you take it off of that harvester, maybe throw it in the refrigerator just to maintain you know, the best viability. If it's gonna be longer, say, say you know, a week or more, throw it in the freezer. They will uh, still be alive once they thaw out. So uh, these are very sturdy bacteria. Um, and you know, partly that's why we selected them. The other thing we've done is made sure that no matter what kind of water you're adding it with, uh, that they're gonna survive. So even water with some chlorine in it uh, will, will be no problem for these bacteria. And that's not true of many, many products. Um, are there new, new products being researched? Uh, we certainly are exploring some options uh, with new products. Um, and so that's an ongoing effort. Uh, we, we are screening some things. We're looking at a, you know, a new product or two in this lineup. So the answer is yes. Okay, thanks, Dan. All right, really. So we've, we've kind of covered the front end fermentation products, um, really ideal for you know, your alfalfa here, this 11H50. Um, the one I want you to think about next is the back end. So this, remember we talked about the heating on the back end of, of fermentation. So these are the Buchneri inoculants. And again, they're very specific to the product you're putting it on. So 11C33 is our corn silage inoculant with Buchneri in it. 11H91 is our high moisture corn inoculant. And then 11G22 would be for alfalfa and grasses and cereal silages. Uh, so specific again to the, pro to the forage crop that you're putting it on, um, these are very effective at reducing back end heating. I like to do a demonstration uh, at times where, you know, if I, I know a customer has a silo full uh, that's been treated with Buchneri, I uh, go and take, you know, little pails full of the, the treated silage out of the silo and I'll bring it to customers who aren't using this product and uh, set it in their milk house or something and, and say, now tell me when it gets hot and I'll come back a week later and it will still be cool. So that's, that's the level of you know, stability that we're adding to this. One of the things we've added in recent years with this technology is a, 
um, what we call the rapid react uh, product. So we are getting achieving that aerobic stability in a relatively short period of time in seven to 10 days, as compared to, we used to say, wait at least 45 days. But these newer strains uh, are doing it much quicker and uh, continuing to do what we ask it to do. So at the end of the day, what a silo wants, it, you know, it, it really wants correct moisture. It doesn't want to be too wet, not too dry. It needs sugars to feed that, that bacteria, especially those good ones that we're trying to grow. It needs anaerobic conditions. So we need to exclude oxygen as fast and as quickly as possible. Um, you know, so that's why, you know, we encourage really good packing. We encourage that you get that silage covered just as fast as you can after uh, putting it in a silo. And then finally, the right bugs. Uh, we want the sort of that fast, efficient lactic acid bacteria. We like to have the uh, Buchneri bacteria for the, for the back end. Um, but all in all, we want a very efficient fermentation so that you have more digestible silage coming back out of the silo. So I know that was somewhat of a, a speed, speed run through inoculants, but uh, certainly open to answer any questions here. I think, yeah, thanks, Dan. I think it was good. Uh, there are two more new, new questions here. Can you see them? Yes. Uh, so how do you uh, thaw out those frozen products? Um, I, I would suggest not putting them in a microwave. Um, it requires a little bit of you know planning ahead. Just leave them out in in the shed or the shop uh, to, to thaw out. Um, you know, so you're gonna have to be thawing it out a day or so ahead of when you think you're going to harvest. And then for chopping snaplage, what would you use? Um, good question. Uh, snaplage, you know, is sort of that combination product. I would probably lean towards the 11B91, which is what we use for high moisture corn because you're dealing with a little bit, uh, you know, a predominantly corn-based product here, that strain seems to work the best in those for snaplage. And then uh, quick comments on the fiber technology inoculants, uh, certainly a, another uh, line of products that we sell on inoculants. These are very unique um, strains of bacteria, again, having the, the Buchneri strain in it, uh, but what they do is they help attack the linkages between lignin and cellulose or, or hemicellulose in the, in the plant fibers. And they do that over a period of time while it's in the silo. And that what that leads to is more digestible forage coming out of that, that forage. And, um, you know, because lignin is indigestible in the cow, uh, it, being linked to cellulose means that it often, the good digestible cellulose exits the cow along with the lignin. If we can unlink the two, then we can access the energy that the cellulose ha has in it uh, and we can digest that. Uh, so again, we have product specific uh, or, or forage specific products in this lineup. Um, we see that the best use with these in you know very good herd production uh, situations where you're doing a lot of other things well. This often allows you to pull back on some of the grain that you're feeding as well as um, some of the protein that you're feeding because you're getting more energy out of that forage uh, than we would uh, with other inoculants. Yeah, fermentation scores. Um, you know, they can be helpful. Uh, the acid proportions, you know, can be informative. I'm not sure that they are always, you know, let me put it this way. So I, I think when you think of a fermentation in a silo, it's, it's almost that every fermentation is a unique creature. Um, the mix of good and bad bacteria, the mix of, you know, how you, are packing it, chopping it, chop length, all of those factors create a unique situation in every silo. So you, you know, your goal is to 
you know, by adding an inoculant to increase the proportion, for instance, with a front end inoculant of lactic acid, it doesn't mean you won't see some acetic and, you know, you won't see some propionic or other acids, but the goal is to get that pH down there. And so in, in some ways this can be helpful. Um, it's not always, you know, the most informative, but it certainly helps you understand, are we getting, are we getting the proper acids out of our fermentation that we were targeting. Thanks, Dan, for answering those questions. Um, we can also submit questions to Dan uh, later on if we have if we have any follow-up questions. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to join this meeting today, Karis and the Marcutlet team. Um, I'll try and keep this brief. There's only a few products that Karis asked me to speak about that are uh, possibly a good fit for dairy operations and can possibly contribute to higher protein in, in your, um, your forage plans. So with that, I'm just going to roll along. So uh, North Star Seed, we're a 100% forage focused uh, seed company, Canadian owned by a group of uh, shareholders. Our head office is based in Nipawa, and we also have a warehouse and uh, facility in Okotoks, Alberta. And we've been around for uh, almost um, over 30 years. And I've been pleased to be working with uh, Mark Hutlett's team for uh, since 2016. So um, we've steadily added more products to your, pro your portfolio that have worked in the, in the dairy environment and we hope to continue to do so. Um, so there's one alfalfa product that you may or may not have heard about from uh, North Star Seed. We were excited to launch this in, uh, actually it came out in 2019. Um, Revolution MD is our max digest, uh, similar to the Hygest products you may have, have heard of. So this is a highly digestible alfalfa and uh, very large leaf area uh, with a very high leaf to stem ratio. So this contributes to a high relative forage quality rating and uh, a high uh, rate of digestion. And uh, the lower fiber uh, is a contribution of the high leaf to stem area and uh, lower stems uh, per plant. So that's also contributing to your high relative forage quality. Um, it is available. We have good supply this year. If you are interested, please, please talk to Karis and her team and we can help uh, line this up for you. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about were some annual crop options. There's been more questions, uh, even on my end of the thing, end of uh, things with regards to annual cropping with some of the challenges, the dry conditions, more uh, customers I find are looking for options with, um, you know, uh, reducing risk for establishment of perennial forages um, and growing annuals, uh, looking at your moisture conditions. It's it's a lot uh, lower risk to, do, to grow some of these annual crops. So there's a, a difference between the cool season and the warm season options. I wanted to point out, um, I'll be speaking to uh, some of the grasses in particular. These would be complementary to your cereals, um, oats and barley, uh, rye and triticale. Um, and on the warm season side, some of the millet options and sorghum sedan grass in particular. Uh, so there's two cool season grasses. Cool season meaning um, they're seeded earlier in the spring. They tend to put on their growth early in like uh, spring and into early summer. And then they tend to shut down when the heat really comes in midsummer. Um, but they do tend to regrow uh, quite well uh, later in August and into September, allowing for multiple cuts. Um, so jungle, Italian ryegrass, this is our uh, newest selection. Uh, many of you I'm sure are familiar with Nabucco, uh, which has been a solid performer for years. Uh, jungle was selected because it had um, superior regrowth to Nabucco um, and very wide succulent leaves, thus being named jungle. 
And uh, it was selected because it was higher yielding than Nabucco. Um, in, in general, Italian ryegrass tends to be a high energy or high sugar content, and that contributes very much to the increased intake and palatability. Um, it, you're very familiar, I'm sure, with the requirements for uh, Italian ryegrass. Uh, it does like high fertility and high moisture. Um, so those two things are very important for maximum yield. And this also contributes to your fertility program. So we recommend that you use a good fertility program to increase your protein content because it will respond. Um, so you want to do a, an early, um, you know, 60 pounds of N um, at seeding. And then if conditions are favorable with moisture after you've taken off your first cut, you can apply up to 30 or 40 pounds of nitrogen for a second cut and you know, crop will respond accordingly. Uh, maturity is 40 to 60 days and um, that's for first cut and then another 25 days later for uh, a subsequent cut. And it can also be grazed if you aren't able to take off as a silage. And it is recommended to use as a silage as opposed to dry hay, it's because of the soft um, leaves there, it's just not very easy for picking up. And I know there've been a few frustrated customers who tried to dry bale it because they didn't need any more silage, but it, you will find it uh, difficult to chew as a dry hay if, uh, if you're wanting to do that, it's better as baleage. Um, seeding rate is typically uh, 10 to 15 pounds an acre, and it's commonly seeded with uh, four oats or barley, um, uh, up to a bushel or, or even three quarters of a bushel would be a good fit. And um, make sure that you seed as shallow as possible. So if you are seeding with a cereal, you'll want to make sure that you're really scratching the surface with the Italian ryegrass, like a quarter of an inch and put your barley or oats in if you can at a deeper depth. It'll have um, less competition. And if you can see it separately, even in a separate pass perpendicular to your um, Italian ryegrass, you'll have a better um, um, yield with the uh, less competition, reduced competition. We have a new uh, festulolium variety. Um, Festulolium is a hybrid grass and there are many different types of crosses. The spring green product that we're carrying this year is a meadow fescue crossed with perennial ryegrass. Um, so there are also tall fescue types where the cross is meadow or fescues with tall fescue and uh, annual ryegrass. Um, but this particular uh, product has shown um, excellent uh, yield and um, better stress tolerance as a hybrid. Uh, I would consider it a short-lived perennial. I wouldn't expect it to survive uh, more than two years. So it is a two-year product. It can have a protein content of 13% or more. Uh, again, this is based on uh, your fertility program and it will respond to higher fertility rates. Um, it also has a high sugar content uh, that's coming from both grass species um, and excellent regrowth. Uh, again, this is another product you could do a split fertilizer application if uh, moisture conditions are available. Um, for the warm season grasses, this is a picture of our uh, millet and sorghum trial in Nipua last hey, summer. Brenda? And we, yeah. Sorry, we just have one question about the uh, kind of about the cool season grass here or as a blend. Um, yep. Can you answer that one before we move on? I'm not seeing it. Can you tell me what the question is? Sure. It's what about using soft tall leaf fescue as a 30% blend with alfalfa versus an annual Italian ryegrass that needs fertility and moisture or timothy blend? So basically, why not 30% tall fescue in, instead of the cover crop. Uh, oh, I was, uh, uh, the soft leaf tall fescue is new again for us this year. 
um, but it is a perennial, so it will survive longer than two years. So I wasn't speaking to it in particular, but absolutely uh, the soft leaf trait is um, tall fescue tends to lose uh, digestibility as it matures. So the soft leaf trait is, is, it would be preferred for dairy ration because of its increased digestibility. So putting it in with alfalfa at 30%, um, the other aspects of tall fescue is uh, it's good for high moisture conditions and it's also good for uh, early signs of salinity. So if you were looking at that sort of scenario in your field, that's where tall fescue would have a good fit. Um, so C4 grasses, as, uh, warm season grasses, they tend to be seeded later in the spring. They need warm soils, um, typically 16 degrees Celsius or more um, in order to grow. And they put on their growth uh, later on in July and August when uh, the cool season grasses are starting to shut down. So depending on your, uh, your farm um, and your situation, this might be a good option if, for instance, spring gets really wet and you aren't able to get in all your acres right away. This product, you know, warm season grasses are a good option for, for later seeding. So we actually have a, a BMR uh, sorghum sedan grass called uh, NS dry stock brand. And it is uh, similar to the corn, uh, the BMR that we were speaking about earlier. It is a brown midrib. And this pro trait provides uh, reduced lignin contents and increased intake and digestibility. With that trait, um, typically it's seeded at about 20 to 25 pounds an acre and uh, seeded from early to mid June. You don't wanna put it into cold soils. Cold stress is really, um, very uh, detrimental to germination. So you definitely wanna wait till the soil is warmed up. And seeding depth about a half to three quarters of an inch. Um, in this particular picture, Mr. Buchanan's field, he's one of our uh, shareholders. This crop went 13 tons. Um, it was actually cut a little late. It should have been cut at uh, the between the 40 to 50 day range or the boot to early dough stage. As it matures, it of course increases fiber content and the quality will start to reduce. So it's really important that you make sure you do cut it um, at the proper stage to harvest the best quality. And there will be some regrowth depending on moisture. If there is available moisture in summer, uh, you can do a second cut after about a month later. Some considerations if you're looking at comparing or, or doing some acres of, of sorghum sedan grass, the BMR, um, compared to corn silage, uh, you should take a sample uh, um, to make sure that the analysis is uh, shared with your, um, your nutritionist and make sure that the, your rations are adjusted accordingly. Because you, as you can see, the protein content is a bit higher compared to corn silage but there is also higher fiber and lower energy levels um, with, with the sorghum sedan. Um, another sort of benefit is the fact that it is a, a lower water requirement than corn. It is a little bit more drought tolerant and the cost of production is lower in that the seed cost is lower, but you're still looking at fertilizing it as a corn crop to maximize your tonnage. So, um, and good wheat, uh, pre-seed wheat control is very essential. It's not a very competitive crop in the beginning and emergence. So you wanna make sure that you've had a very good pre-seed uh, burn off before, before seeding to, uh, to reduce competition. The other um, consideration is um, prussic acid is, uh, uh, an issue if the crop is uh, shorter than two feet tall, which shouldn't be the case, especially in first cut. But if you're looking at your second cut and it is lower than uh, two feet tall, you definitely want to add on a test for prussic acid. It is detrimental in terms of um, the levels. It can uh, be reduced in a silage uh, situation, um, but it's best to have it tested 
and make sure that the prussic acid levels are um, understood so that you can balance your rations accordingly. The other uh, warm season grass that uh, Karis has had a lot of questions about, um, and we've had very good success with is a Japanese millet. Um, it is um, one of the uh, few or only uh, millets that actually has uh, regrowth. So um, that contributes to the very high forage yields. As you can see, it is a very um, dense tillering, um, very tall and leafy plant. Um, it has uh, obvious some tolerance to drought um, because it is a millet to warm season grass, but it's claimed to fame as it can also withstand very high moisture conditions and very heavy wet soils. So if spring is really um, giving us a lot of moisture, we uh, apparently you can seed it into puddles and it will it'll germinate. So it, uh, it can definitely withstand uh, excess moisture as well. Uh, this is a field I uh, was actually with Karis uh, viewing this past summer and uh, in her territory. Um, so as you can see, it can reach a height of three to five feet. Um, the seeding rate should be around 20 pounds an acre. Um, seeded into warm soil from late May to mid June and the maturity for first cut is about 45 to 55 days. Um, seeding depth, similar to the sorghum sedan grass, one half to an inch. And again, the fertility, uh, it really uh, responds in terms of protein content to the N applied. So a pre-seed uh, early um, application of 50 to 80 pounds of N and a top up of 20 to 30 pounds if moisture is in the forecast, uh, the product will respond to that additional N application. If you are hoping to cut, uh, do a second cut, it's important to leave a good stem length uh, in order to capture sunlight and, and increase that second uh, regrowth. Um, it also needs a uh, good pre-seed weed control. Uh, in crop, weed control options are pretty uh, limited, so it's best to do a good job before seeding. Yield can be uh, quite good, three to six tons an acre, and crude protein, I, it can be as high as uh, 15, uh, even 16%, based on um, your fertility program. Perfect, thanks Rhonda. Those are uh, definitely our top, our top products from North Star and uh, also are available in custom blends. We have had more custom blends this year than ever. Uh, it's definitely growing in popularity. It's convenient. Um, you know, there's different packaging types for that too. So if that's of interest, please let us know. We have a Weber portable propane barbecue to give away. That's grand prize number one, as well as grand prize number two, which is one uh, bag of North Star seed here, courtesy of Rhonda uh, from North Star Seeds. Um, and then we have uh, six secondary prize packs that I actually, I'm feeling generous, so there are seven. <laughs> Uh, we, have, we have seven people here for the pickup days food pack um, that we're going to bring to you with our seed. So the grand prize winner number one for the portable propane barbecue that is in Pioneer Green is Evelyn Stam or Henry. <laughs> uh, looks like we have Evelyn's name on the uh, on the audience list, but that would be Henry and Evelyn Stam from Rehoboth Farms. Thank you very much for joining. We'll bring that to you. For our grand prize number two winner, we have uh, Richard Boonstoffel. So again, thanks for joining the uh, meeting today. Uh, you have won the bag of North Star seed, uh, valued up to, up to $275 uh, from Rhonda. And then we have seven uh, additional secondary pickup days prizes. And so number one is Andreas Fair. Thank you for joining today. Uh, we have uh, Barton, or Brad Barton from Barton Farms. Uh, we have Brandon Fring, Fring? <laughs> I, I'm not good 
his names. Uh, we have uh, Charles Kaler for a pickup days pack. We have JP, which I'm thinking is uh, Mr. JP DeYoung on here. And then we have um, Millennium Holsteins. And the last one is Stefan Signer. So those pickup days prize packs will be are coming with your seed delivery or pick up, uh, depending on what happens this spring. We do plan on delivering most of the seed again this year, and we will not be having an open house for pickup days. So um, that's unfortunate, but again, we wanted to bring some of that tradition to you. So that's all we have for today. Those are our winners for the uh, prize packs. And so we'll be in touch with you here. I have the, the list and uh, yeah, if you have any questions regarding the meeting or other topics, um, please feel free to, to contact us. I think there's a survey that'll pop up after this meeting as well. Thanks for joining.